Hello, we're going to be talking about how we describe vowels in phonetics. And keep in mind, this may be different from other ways you may have learned before if you ever studied anything about reading or phonics as opposed to phonetics, since phoneticians get into a lot more details on vowels than you may be used to. So first we're just going to talk about once I hide the toolbar here. All right, that's better. We're going to talk about just the basic descriptions. You're not going to memorize yet all of the different symbols in IPA and the sounds that correspond to them, just how we group vowels in different categories. Okay, so we're going to talk about three main articulatory parameters, but there are more than this. Uh, but when you just des uh, describe a vowel, you usually give at least these three at the bare minimum. You're going to talk about how high the vowel is. And I will explain that in just a moment, but you can think about it as in terms of how close your tongue is to the roof of your mouth. It could be very high, very close to the roof of your mouth when you produce a vowel, like when you do E, if you can try that on your own and see if you can feel where your tongue is, versus ah. Uh, what the doctor has you say so they can look down your throat where your tongue moves down very low and it makes it uh, easier to see back there. So your tongue can be either really high towards the roof or very low. All right, secondly, you can talk about uh, where your tongue is in terms of towards the front of the mouth, towards the back. Right, so that one is harder to put in one word, so we'll call it vowel in front or back for now. Some vowels will be produced closer to the front of the mouth. As you go down, you can sort of feel that all these vowels that I'm about to say are relatively close to the front. E, I, E. And if you compare those to vowels like U and O and A, ah, your tongue tends to move a little bit further back. Although the difference between front and back is a little more subtle to feel than the difference between a high versus a low vowel. All right, but that gives us sort of a position for the tongue that can be put on a grid or put into different dimensions such as vertical versus horizontal position. All right, and the final main uh, description that you will use will be lip shape. And this is one that you probably already know for at least one vowel, although you may have not thought about it that often. So when you want somebody to smile for a picture, you usually ask them to say cheese with a nice big long E vowel in there because our lips are usually spread in such a way that you can see the teeth when we say that vowel. So lip shape can play an important role too. Uh, now besides these are the three main ones, there are some others that I will mention here as well other ways to describe what um, the person is doing when they are producing a particular vowel. You can talk about the tongue shape. Although normally it is going to be convex for most vowels. meaning that there's always sort of an arch to the shape of the tongue. 
I, it's not necessarily completely flat and lifeless. Also, we can think of the jaw position. That relates to the height. So naturally, as our tongue is moving up and down in our mouth, our jaw might have to move to accommodate it. So if you hold on to your jaw and feel what it's doing, does it move when you move between E and ah? Try that a few times and then you can see how your jaw position changes between E and ah. All right, so if we return to the idea, though, of vertical versus horizontal space. All right, so we have, I will write here, our vertical dimension versus the horizontal. You can imagine the space that's in the mouth as representing this space here on this slide. It feels sort of this irregular shape. It's not exactly like a circle or an oval, but our mouth sort of has this um, rough shape of whatever you want to call it. But if you want to imagine a mouth superimposed on this, just have some patience with my bad drawing skills here. You can imagine there's a lip, sort of. A really funky lip and then here is the jaw all right so here's the nose and there maybe is our teeth and lower teeth there and your tongue moves around in that space so you can have something that is for example relatively high on the vertical scale so the tongue is up here and relatively close to the front of the mouth as well. If you try and connect those to those two dimensions. And this is how we normally think of vowels at the bare minimum. All right, so what phoneticians have done is they've taken this sort of idea of a vowel space. You'll often hear this referred to as the vowel space, um, and they've superimposed it on a different shape called the quadrilateral. Right? But sometimes people use these terms. Um, actually, I mean space here interchangeably: the vowel space or the vowel quadrilateral. It's just a way to divide up this sort of what we had as a more softly rounded shape before. Oops, let me get my pen working. And dividing it up into various sectors where we can slot different vowels in. I will just write two here, although you will be learning about where these vowels get stuck in this shape in uh, the upcoming lectures. But let's say the vowel E would be put up in this space, meaning that it is a front and a high vowel. So we can choose from spaces either across, you know, front versus back, front, central, or back. And we can say that E is also a high vowel, choosing between the options high, mid, or low. All right, so in comparison, you can use another vowel that we talked about already, ah, the one that you say at the doctor, and say that that one is a back vowel, choosing between the options front, central, or back. And you can say that it is a low vowel, choosing between the options high versus mid versus low. Right, so you're always going to, let me erase 
clear out this space to summarize here. When describing vowels, you're always going to describe them in terms of options here in blue, number one, front, central, or back. All right, as well as these options here, high, mid, or low. And then you add on to that lip shape. And that's at the bare minimum when talking about a vowel. And we'll get into some more of the extras as well. Uh, but first, here are the various lip shapes that you can have when you talk about vowels. Now, spread is the one that we talked about before in terms of vowels like E as in the word cheese. All right, that's the one that we use to make sort of a smiling shape to our lips because our lips will naturally spread whenever we say the vowel E. And the other major one that we need to distinguish for certain special vowels is lip rounding. All right, so you can say the vowel ooh, for example, as in ooh, what a cute baby, or coo. or shoe, for example. And you can just feel how your lips pucker up when you make those sounds. All right, so try coo, shoe, and just try not to round your lips. You're going to get something that probably sounds a little funny. Like if I try and say ooh and unround my lips while I'm saying it, ooh, ooh, is what you end up getting a vowel that doesn't quite sound like ooh. So it's very important to make the distinguishing um, characteristic of lip shape when you're describing how a vowel is produced. Um, besides those two options we talked about, spread and rounded, you also have neutral. Normally, if you don't have something after the uh, vowel height in front versus back, uh, some people might leave that off you are assuming a neutral lip shape, which just means that your lips are not rounded, they're not spread, they're just somewhere in between those two extremes. And so you can even visualize that here as between those two extremes, you get neutral, somewhere in between. Okay, so we've talked about three main parameters and a little bit about jaw position and other things, uh, but also important for later use in speech pathology, uh, sometimes we need to refer to whether a vowel is tense or lax. And this is a very tricky area here because sometimes it can be language specific. So when I talk about let's say, for example, E being a tense vowel, that may be specific to English, but it might not work to how the vowel E, which is used in lots of different languages around the world, how it's produced by its own speakers. So it's very important when you use these descriptions that you be specific about the language you're talking about. Um, but basically, tense vowels have greater muscular activity and are longer in duration. Meaning when you say it, they tend to stretch out longer versus lax vowels, which have less muscular activity and are shorter in duration. All right, so vowels that are tense, I will write around with you as you might want to make note of this yourself, more muscular activity and longer, while lax vowels are a little bit less 
on the muscular activity and shorter. And it's useful to think of them as pairs. They tend to uh, be produced in the same place. If you are thinking of, let's go back here to the vowel quad quadrilateral. So you might have a pair that in fact are both front and high. Right, so that's what I'm going to use here for an illustration, but you can feel actually the difference in the muscular activity when you produce them. All right, so follow along here. Humor me by placing two fingers on your throat, um, sort of halfway between your larynx, which hopefully you can sort of spot by now, but if not, feel where your Adam's apple is, right, that sort of spot on your neck that sort of sticks out that is part of your larynx. So you want to put your fingers so that they're above that Adam's apple and getting close to your chin. So you can find, kind of feel that space there between your Adam's apple and chin. That's where you want to feel on your throat, where you're going to feel that muscular activity the most because you're feeling the base of the tongue there. All right, so have your fingers there and then produce after me the vowels E. Feel how that first vowel feels. And then say I. E. 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 You should feel a great difference in the muscular activity where E, you can really feel that muscle bunch up and tense, whereas E definitely feels lax, sort of relaxed. You can think of it that way. Um, if that helps you remember that term. Because the word lax is sort of embedded there in that lax. All right, so I'm going to mention which vowels we classify in each of these groups, although you will be learning um, in upcoming lectures what those symbols are and the sounds they connect, but this is just for your notes right now. So the tense vowels in English, we generally consider E to be one of those. A is one of them. U and O. And for our lax vowels, we have I, which looks like a uppercase I, E, which looks sort of like a backwards three, U, as in put, which really doesn't look like anything we're used to describing in terms of letters. It's sometimes called a handlebar U because it has these little handlebars and in between you get something that looks like a U shape. And finally, aw, which looks like sort of an open O or a backward C. Oftentimes people just call that open O. Uh, but this last vowel here, I will just put a star next to since phoneticians argue over this vowel, whether it is really lax or tense, uh, but that's not so important for us as beginners in phonetics, just remember it is lax in the way we're treating it in this class. Okay, now we're going to talk about another way of classifying vowels, but this one may be most familiar. Sometimes if you've had any sort of instruction in phonics or uh, reading techniques or teaching children how to read, oftentimes you'll hear people talking about short versus long vowels. And in English, it's not very important in terms of um, description. It's something that just sort of falls out the way it is. But if you happen to say a so-called long vowel and you don't hold it out as long as, let's say, another person, it doesn't mean that the person won't be able to understand you. 
Um, this is what we call in linguistics as being phonemic, meaning that it makes a difference in meaning. So if I say the word, let's say C, which is just the transcription of the word C here, and I hold it out really long, that's what those two little dots mean. And I happen to say it really long like this, C. It might just sound like I'm being sarcastic, like C. Uh, or I say it just normally, C. You're not going to understand that to being two different words. All right, that's what would make it phonemic. If there were actually two different words and it just happened to mean something different like tree, let's say, just make up something. But that's not true. No matter how long I hold out that E, it just means the same word C. So instead, if you just sit there and go C, and you just sound goofy, rather than like you're trying to say a different word. Uh, but, you know, we do recognize that there are certain patterns in English, and there is some usefulness in grouping vowels into long versus short. For one thing, long vowels only occur in uh, either one-syllable words, just like we had here in the example C is a one syllable word. It just lasts from one beat. And it can occur in open and closed syllables. Right? An open syllable would be, for example, C again is another one where there's no consonant at the end. It just ends in a vowel. So it's a consonant vowel versus a, I forgot here to write closed. Here we go. Versus a closed syllable where there is a consonant after that vowel. So for example, uh, let's say heat, where there is a consonant that H, the vowel, E, spelled here with E, A, and T as the next consonant. All right, so we've noticed looking at vowels in English that long vowels can basically show up anywhere. Uh, but interestingly, short vowels in English only show up in one syllable words, just like we talked about before. And closed syllables. All right, so again, those syllables where there is a consonant after the vowel. So if you think of something like I, a vowel that's very close to E, then you're only going to find it in words like hit, something with a consonant at the end. There is no word hit or dick or pit. You can go through and try and find a rhyme. And if you find something that nobody's noticed for hundreds of years, please let me know so I can get credit for it. Uh, those are sort of those two main patterns there for vowels then and why we list them and make a, a sort of a difference in talking about long versus short. All right, so for your reference, now I'm going to list the different vowels, although you will be learning, covering them again in more detail coming up. But for your notes at this purpose, at this point in time, you're going to use these symbols and sounds for each group. So E, as we talked about before, is a long vowel. Aw is a long vowel, oo is a long vowel, and ah uh is a long vowel. Now our short vowels include I, that one that looks like a capital I, 
a that sort of backwards three a as in cat and hat uh as in uh oh uh as in put and another one that is a special vowel we're going to talk about. It looks like an upside down E. It's also a, uh, as in uh oh, uh, but there's a reason why we have two different ways of writing it that you do not have to worry about at this point. Okay, so if you haven't had enough of different classification systems, there is yet another one uh, that refers to more of the perceptual characteristics rather than the articulatory that we've been talking about. Okay, so remember from earlier that articulatory talks about how you position different body parts. Right, so it's all about where your tongue is placed, how your lips are shaped, how your jaw is positioned, everything we've talked about before. This has to do with perception. All right, solely. So this is how the vowel sounds to you. Does it sound like a vowel that is produced really close to the front of the mouth and really high up? And when we talk about vowels, we have to be very careful to note, are we talking about perceptual characteristics or production or articulatory characteristics? And on the IPA chart that we are looking at in this class, and I'm going to switch over to now, Vowels are listed in perceptual positions. Now this is because in all the languages of the world, you may have something that sounds a lot like the vowel we've been using a lot as an example, like this little E here, uh, but different speakers in different languages will produce something that sounds like an E, but their tongue will be in slightly different positions. Uh, now you may think you be thinking, who cares? Well, phoneticians care about these really minute differences. So we have two different ways of talking about things. We say, you know, in terms of the IPA chart, well, this sounds like an E. Um, and then when we get into really into the nitty gritty details, we get more specific, which is why you may see uh, in the IPA chart that E is all the way at an extreme corner, just like I've done here. While earlier, when we were talking about articulation and where to put a vowel like E, I drew it pretty much smack dab in here. I didn't draw it way out over here. Because in terms of English, what we do is more like we have our tongue way here. We don't have it sticking out of the top of our mouth or at any extreme position. All right, so just keep in mind that for now we're talking about perceptual or theoretical vowels. That if you put your tongue at the highest point in your mouth and furthest forward you can, you will inevitably get something that resembles this vowel here, E. Now one other thing you may notice when you look at this IPA chart is slightly different terms than I used. Now I like to use high versus low because I believe that that is more um, easy for beginners to understand. Unfortunately, like a lot of things in the field of communication disorders, there's more than one term that can refer to the same thing. So sometimes high is also called close. So I will put there high and, you know, just replace any time you see close with high. So this would be high mid. 
and low is sometimes referred to as open. So low, mid, and then here are our lowest vowels here. So sometimes you will run into those terms. Just be prepared that they mean the same thing as the terms we've talked about before. High means the same as close because the tongue is close to the top of the mouth. And open means the same thing as low because the tongue is down there at the bottom and it's like your mouth is wide open, if that's how you can help remember how those terms relate. All right, so we've talked about how these are perceptual vowels. They're not really meant to resemble what you're actually doing with your tongue, um, just what you hear with your ears. And it's also important to note here that this chart does not cover all the vowels we're going to talk about in English. What it has instead are two different types of vowels that we are going to just briefly go over. And I'm going to go back to my slide on that and highlight it here. So perception is what you hear. And the two main types we're going to talk about are primary cardinal vowels and secondary. All right, we're going to start with those and we're going to leave the other vowels for later. Primary vowels are those very extreme vowels at the edges here. All right, so we have these four vowels at the very edge and four vowels here on the opposite edge of the quadrilateral. All right, so if you go down the end, each edge, you've got E, A, E, A, E, and oh, I left out A. Ah for example. And if you go all the way to the back, we've got O, O, A, and A. Ah. And those are called our primary cardinal vowels. So if you have your tongue at these most extreme positions, this is what you're going to hear. And the secondary vowels are meant to represent vowels that are produced exactly like the primary cardinal vowels, but they differ by lip rounding. So we have a different lip shape. So in terms of those front vowels, the ones here up in the front, all the ones I circled in red are ones we don't round in English, but these will all be rounded. So all of these vowels here you can try and produce on your own if you say the ones in red first and then you try rounding your lips. So just for example, I will just do this first set here. Here we have E and then try and hold on to that E and then slowly round your lips and you'll get E instead of E. E. You try and hold your tongue steady and round your lips and you'll be able to produce a sound that corresponds to that symbol that looks like a little lowercase y. All right, so that's why I wanted to switch to this one, where if you want to play around with this web page um, that I've provided on Blackboard, you can hear all these differences between these different vowels and see if you can imitate them. Mm. Mm. All right, so E and U. All right, see if you can sound like the speaker or what your vowels sound like when you try it. E. E. All right, just experiment on your own if you like. Now, in the back, it's a different case. All of these vowels are pretty much rounded, except for the way I probably produced this one initially. We don't normally do this in English. 
all is kind of British sounding. Normally we do this one, ah. Uh, but you'll notice all these vowels, if you try and say it, ooh, oh, ah, and all, if you try and say that and you make yourself sound British, are rounded. So the secondary vowels here in the back are the unrounded versions. So when you try and change between the two, try and start out with your lips rounded and unround them to get the secondary vowel and see what it sounds like if you try playing between like ooh and the unrounded counterpart. Keep your tongue in the same position, but just try unrounding your lips and spreading them. All right, they're going to mostly get vowels that do not sound like anything we do in English. Uh, but since in communication disorders we're not dealing with purely English vowels, our subjects or clients may be speakers of any number of languages, or they might make errors that are not sounding just like they would in normal English. We have to be prepared to describe these vowels um, no matter what. So this is where all of the full set here in the IPA vowel quadrilateral comes in handy. When you start producing sounds that are, or trying to transcribe sounds that aren't in English or are disordered and are not like anything you commonly encounter in English, you might have to turn to this chart to figure out how to transcribe that vowel in a way that anyone with some phonetics background would understand. All right, so those are perceptual descriptions. Note here how far front and how high this I is. And then look at how things are actually produced in American English. And you'll see what I mean again by uh, the IPA vowels being more of a theoretical thing where the tongue is not like way out over here. In reality, for American English, E is normally produced with the tongue here um, in this position. And so just note how the different vowel positions actually look when you look at it, let's say if you had an x-ray and you could actually see the tongue very clearly and have this sort of half slice view of the human head and see where the tongue is frozen when these vowels are produced. So ooh, our vowel that should be, you know, according to what we've talked about, be very high and back is actually with the tongue there as I've outlined in blue. And ah, uh, the one that we also normally say in American English looks like so. It's relatively far down and back in the mouth, but it's not all the way down here, for example. That's just not physically possible. All right, so before we finish up, we're going to talk about two final ways to classify vowels, and these are things we're going to get into more detail. There are two different main types of vowels that we can also group things into, what we talked about tense or lax, long or short. There is also monosongs versus diphthongs. Right? Monothongs is this first one here. And those are also called steady sometimes or pure vowels. That's because when you say it, they sort of sound the same throughout. The vowel doesn't seem to sound like it's moving around on you. So when I say E, nothing is changing. It's completely steady versus a diphthong where depending on the diphthong, you're going to hear things change a lot. 
right? And for an example of that that works really well in English is I, right? What we sometimes will write as for a first person, I. It's not just ah, not just I. I. We can sort of hear this change from the beginning and you can feel your tongue move along from I as you say it. And that's just what diphthong is. It means that tongue is moving from one position to another during something that we tend to group together as one sound. We don't write the vowel that represents that word I as two different vowels uh, for reasons that just uh, follow along with how English works as a language. And we'll go into more detail about diphthongs and what makes them special uh, in our upcoming lecture on vowels. Finally, we can talk about whether vowels are so-called non-rhotic or rhotic. Right, so if you were wondering what the heck this word here is and how you say it, rhotic. Right, and rhotic is just sort of a term that means something that resembles that R sound. I think pirates are. So some vowels have absolutely no R-like quality to them. Like that E we talked about before. We're not talking about ear or anything like that. Just plain E does not have anything in that vowel that sounds like a R, like an R sound. But we do have lots of things that do sound like R's and sort of blend the category or sort of the blend the blur the lines between something that is like an R and something that is a vowel. And those are called our rhotic vowels. Those are, for example, things like er, as in that last sound in the word paper, or bird, where you've got that vowel there, er, as well. So basically, in English, you have only two rhotic vowels to worry about, the one in paper versus bird, and then everything else falls into that non-rhotic group. All right, so that is the end of our discussion of all these different groups you can place vowels in. All right, so practice how you can describe different vowels. What are all these classification systems and how can you group them? Can a vowel be, uh, let's say, rhotic and long at the same time? Or is it rhotic, uh, let's say, long, tense, all these different classifiers? As we start talking about the specific vowels of American English, you will be responsible for knowing what group your vowel falls into. Uh, so a little bit of practice of knowing what these groups are and what they mean before we talk about those vowels is helpful.